feel that anticipation. Yes, it's in the air. Christmas time. That's this season of sacredness, this season of love. And you may feel this pull, this pull to create a new, to create from that sacred knowing, from that place of love. Sharing the truth. We are all of God. We are all of God. Now, I know sometimes in the last couple of years, it's kind of been feeling a little tumultuous, you know, and it's, it feels like we've been challenged. But I'm here to invite you to see that as a moment to create anew, to find new ways to create in love, in truth, in the knowing of who and what we are, God expressing. So I'm going to share with you a video that I just think is really powerful of a time long ago that was really tumultuous, and yet, yet, they figured out a way to create anew. This is a true story written by History.com. The Christmas truce occurred on and around Christmas Day 1914, when the sounds of rifles firing and shells exploding faded in a number of places along the Western Front during World War I in favor of holiday celebrations. During the unofficial ceasefire, Soldiers on both sides of the conflict emerged from the trenches and shared gestures of goodwill. Starting on Christmas Eve, many German and British troops fighting in World War I sang Christmas carols to each other across the lines, and at certain points, the Allied soldiers even heard brass bands joining the Germans in their joyous singing. At the first light of dawn on Christmas Day, some German soldiers emerged from their trenches and approached the Allied lines across no man's land, calling out, Merry Christmas, in their enemies' native tongues. At first, the Allied soldiers feared it was a trick, but seeing the Germans unarmed, they climbed out of their trenches and shook hands with the enemy soldiers. The men exchanged presents of cigarettes and plum puddings and sang carols and songs. Some Germans lit Christmas trees around their trenches, and there was even a documented case of soldiers from opposing sides playing a good-natured game of soccer. German Lieutenant Kurt Zeimisch recalled how marvelously wonderful yet how strange it was. The English officers felt the same way about it. Thus, Christmas, the celebration of love, managed to bring mortal enemies together as friends for a time. Some soldiers used their short-lived ceasefire for a more somber task, the retrieval of the bodies of fellow combatants who had fallen within the no man's land between the lines. The so-called Christmas truths of 1914 came only five months after the outbreak of war in Europe and was one of the last examples of the outdated notion of chivalry between enemies in warfare. It was never repeated. Future attempts at holiday ceasefires were quashed by officers' threats of disciplinary action but it served as heartening proof, however brief, that beneath the brutal clash of weapons, the soldier's essential humanity endured. During World War I, the soldiers on the Western Front did not expect to celebrate on the battlefield, but even a world war could not destroy the Christmas spirit.
World War I, 1914, in the middle of hell on earth, they created a moment of heaven on earth. They were guided to the knowing of oneness regardless of nationality. And so that Christmas in 1914, they were able to celebrate the real meaning of the birth of Christ. So my question is, if soldiers in the middle of wartime, in the middle of wartime, could create a new for that one moment. What could you create? What will you create? If you got clarity on what's yours to do, on what's your purpose. So as we continue on our Advent celebration, I'm inviting you to find new ways New ways to listen to spiritual guidance. This is the fourth week of Advent. The theme this week is love. 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 And yet often during this time of the year, what's happening, we're so busy hurrying up and trying to do all that's needed to get done in preparation for Christmas. At times, we are abrupt and harried as we check those tasks off our list. We may even feel anxious and stressed out by all the demands made on us. And when someone wants just a little bit of our time and our compassion, we may even get annoyed at the impact that this is going to take on our getting our list done. We get so caught up in these tasks that we confuse these tasks for goals in our creation plans. Maria Namath in her book, The Energy of Money, says that we are often so busy accomplishing tasks that have nothing to do with the life we want. She also says that we get confused thinking that our tasks are our goals. And I love that she pointed out, how do we tell the difference between a task and a goal? And she says, when we finish a task, we feel relief. Got her done. But when we complete a goal, we feel joy. Joy. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Namath also reminds us that to live a meaningful life, we must create those goals anchored in our life intentions, because when they are anchored in our life intentions, what that means is it provides a conduit for energy to bring these goals into physical reality. And our life intentions are who we are at depth. It's the heart of us. What are we passionate about? What really matters to us and what makes us whole and complete? It's so easy to forget our true nature. We get caught up in our societal roles and lives lived by conforming to other people's expectations of us. You know, in unity, we have a saying, it's all love and love is all there is, right? Nothing else matters. But do we really live our lives as if that is our truth? So I want to share a story with you. It is written by Willie Eagle, and it's a powerful example of living in action from love. And the title is Because of Love. A brother and sister had made their usual harried, obligatory pre-Christmas visit to the little farm where where dwelt their elderly parents with their small herd of horses. The farm was where they had grown up and had been named Lone Pine Farm because of the huge pine which topped the hill behind the farm. 
The young siblings had fond memories of their Christmas here, but the city bustle and hustle added more excitement to their lives and called them away to a different life. The old folks no longer showed their horses, for the years had taken their toll. And getting out to the barn on those frosty mornings was getting a little harder, but it gave them a reason to get up in the mornings and a reason to live. Angry as they prepared to leave, the young siblings confronted their parents. Why do you not at least dispose of the old one? She is no longer of use to you. It's been years since you've had foals from her. You should just cut corners and save so you can have more for yourselves. How can this worn out horse bring anything else but expense and work. Why do you keep her anyway? The old man looked down at his worn boots, holes in the toes. He scuffed the barn floor and replied, yes, I could use a new pair of boots. His arm slid defensively around the old one's neck as he drew her near with gentle caressing. He rubbed her softly behind her ears, he, rep he replied, we keep her because of love. Nothing else, just love. Baffled and irritated, the young folks wished their parents a Merry Christmas and headed back toward the city as darkness stole across the valley. So it was that because of that unhappy leave-taking, no one noticed the insulation smoldering on the frayed wires in the barn. None saw the first spark fall. In a matter of minutes, the whole barn was ablaze and the hungry flames were licking at the loft full of hay. With a cry of horror and despair, the old man shouted to his wife, call for help, as he raced to the barn to save his beloved horses. But the flames were roaring now, and the blazing heat drove him back. He sank, sobbing to the ground, helpless before the fire's fury. His wife, back from calling for help, cradled him in her arms, clinging to each other. They wept at their loss. By the time the fire department arrived, only smoking, glowing ruins were left. And the old man and his wife, exhausted from their grief, huddled together before the barn. They were speechless as they rose from the cold, covered ground. They nodded thanks to the firemen, as there was nothing anyone could do now. The old man turned to his wife, resting her white head upon his shoulders as his shaking old hands clumsily dried her tears with a frayed red bandana. Brokenly, he whispered, we have lost much, but our home has been spared on this eve of Christmas. Let us gather strength and climb the hill to the old pine where we sought comfort in times of despair. We will look down upon our home, give thanks to God that it has been spared, and pray for our beloved most precious gifts that have been taken from us. The journey up the hill was hard for the old bodies in the steep snow. And as they stepped over the little knoll at the crest of the hill, they paused to rest, looking up to the top of the hill the old couple gasped and fell to their knees in amazement at the incredible beauty before them. Seemingly, every glorious, brilliant star in the heaven were caught up in the glittering, snow-frosted branches of their beloved pine, and it was aglow with heavenly candles. Suddenly, the old man gave a cry of wonder and incredible joy. Amazed and mystified, he took his wife by the hand and pulled her forward there beneath the the tree in resplendent glory, a mist hovering over and glowing in the darkness was their Christmas gift. Shadows glistening in the night light bedded down around the old one. Close to the trunk of the tree was the entire herd safe. At the first hint of smoke, she had pushed the door ajar with her muzzle and had led the horses through it. Slowly, with great dignity, never looking back, she had led them up the hill 
stepping cautiously through the snow. The foals were frightened and dashed about. The skittish yearlings looked back at the crackling, hungry flames and tucked their tails under them as they licked their lips and hopped like rabbits. The mares that were in foal with a New Year's crop of babies pressed uneasily against the old one as she moved calmly up the hill and to safety beneath the pine. And now she lay among them and gazed at the faces of the old man and his wife. Those she loved, she had not disappointed. Her body was brittle with years, tired from the climb, but the golden eyes were filled with devotion as she offered her gift because of love, only because of love. Tears flowed as the old couple shouted their praise and joy, and again, the peace of love filled their hearts. Heartwarming, isn't it? So why did I share this with you? To make you cry, of course, yes. <laughs> but because I'm inviting you to listen to your spiritual guides. Listen as they remind you of your truth and how to create anew. You see, spiritual wisdom comes in many ways. That story may or may not be true, but it doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter because there's an opening that just happened. So spiritual wisdom comes in many ways. It could be a story. It could be a stranger. It could be a book, a conversation, a walk in nature, meditating, or even through a virtual service like this here. There's lots of tools that you can utilize to manifest the life that you really want, the life that you deserve, the life that you incarnated to have before you forgot. So let's talk about a few of those tools. Giving yourself time to breathe, but not just breathe, like, <laughs> no, breathe <laughs> deeply, right? Science has already proven that breathing deeply allows the heart rate to slow down, releases those chemical endorphins within our body that flows through the nervous system, calms us, releases anxiety. Breathing deeply improves our ability to pay attention. It even reduces pain levels. And guess what? With reduced pain, with reduced anxiety, we get to focus, not within, right? We get to be able to focus outside of our small and finite world. And then we connect to source and guides. Because once we move past our small, finite world, we now have the chance to go beyond this realm. We are then able to connect in beautiful, mystical ways to God, to allness, to our spirit guides, to our ancestors, and gain spiritual insights and honor the truth that you are a spiritual being. It's so easy to forget that when we are here on planet Earth. And then, as we do that communing, we get to remember our life's intentions. You know those agreements that we made before we incarnated here? We get to remember those. And from this awakened awareness, then, we get to commit to living our truth, commit to writing those goals down that we remember. How are we going to live that life through the goals now from that loving intention? And lastly, making room for God, spirit, ancestors, making room for them to support us because it's so often that we think we are doing this alone. Suck it up, buttercup. I don't know how many times I've said that to myself. <laughs> Suck it up, buttercup. Just do it, right? Forgetting that I have support. Forgetting I have support if I allow God to be worried about the outcomes. 
and simply focus on what my goals are. So, as I mentioned to you just a little while ago, our theme this week is love, love. If you're at home and you haven't lit your Advent candle, I invite you to do so now as we look at really going into our meditation practice and affirming this week's affirmation. This week, it is I receive and embrace the spiritual guidance I am given, which shows me how to create love and abundance in my life. This Christmas, you are creating anew. This Christmas, I invite you to create from a place of love, a place of possibility, a place of this now moment. Let's prepare for meditation. (laughs) 